What's up, guys, and uh, welcome to the very first installment of the Savage Sports Blog Podcast, and I'm very excited to get things up and running with this podcast. At Savage Sports Blog, we have seen an exponential increase in traffic to the blog. You can follow it at savagesportsblog.wordpress.com. And we've also seen a good increase in the followers on Twitter, which you can follow at Savage Sport Blog. And here at Savage Sports Blog, what we're trying to do is give our readers, followers, etc., in-depth insight on impact front office decisions have on franchises. If you haven't read any of my blog posts yet, you'll know that I like to take uncommon stances when analyzing front office decisions. And what I really hope you can get out of this is a chance to hear a different viewpoint that is commonly seen in the media. And I've been wanting to start something like this for a long time, and it's finally coming to fruition. And I'm very happy to say that we will soon be getting some guests on the program, but for now, I really want our followers and active readers to get to know me. You can get to know my take on front office decisions and sports debates, and, you know, it's really going to help you and connect with me and better know what I'm talking about when I'm writing articles. So without further ado, let's start the episode, uh, an episode which will be centered around baseball. And I just have to say that this baseball season is is going to be a good one. We're a, a little past a third of the way through the season right now. And uh, we got a team in the Chicago Cubs that are in the conversation as one of the best teams in the MLB in the past, I don't know, decade or so. And, uh, you know, I actually went out to see a game uh, down in Philly, saw Lester pitch eight innings, three hits, no earned. And they're, they're an impressive bunch. And, you know, they got some depth. And uh, even without Schwarber in the outfield, they, they seem like they're, uh, they're just the team to beat this year. And, uh, but that's not to mention that there's some other teams like, say, the San Francisco Giants, the Washington Nationals that are going to challenge them in the NL. And then in the AL, we got, we got the Royals. Royals are good again. Um, we got a couple teams that, like the Boston Red Sox, if they get a starting pitcher, we can see them. And I, I think it might be, as of right now, I see the Royals and the Red Sox as the two teams to beat in the AL. But, you know, there's a lot of tight races. The AL Central is tight. And uh, the AL East, you know, it always comes down to a couple teams. And the NL East is tight again. The Mets and the Nationals. So I think there's going to be a lot of good races, a lot of good division races, wild card races, pennant races. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just really excited for the rest of the baseball season. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot of baseball on the Savage Sports blog. So... So gear up for that. And uh, in this first episode, uh, I want to first go into my take on the Jake Arrieta contract. That was my latest blog post, and I got I got a lot of people reaching out to me and uh, talking to me about that post, and got some good traffic. So I think it's worth mentioning uh, my take on the Jake Arrieta contract situation with the Cubs and Theo Epstein and the front office. So it's definitely worth mentioning, and it's a, it's a predicament for the Cubs in the offseason coming up. So uh, after that, we're going to delve into what the MLB draft has in store with us. And that's going to be coming up on Thursday. And I'll break down some of the top prospects, see team needs. I'm going to analyze these prospects, make comparisons. And, you know, the MLB draft's a great time because you get to see the teams that, you know, aren't, aren't the best right now. You've seen teams rebuild through the draft, teams like the Royals, the Astros. Um, so... It's always good to see the, the teams that haven't been doing as well get a chance to rebuild and get some get some studs on the team. So we'll look into that as that's a very important time for some teams at the in the cellar of the MLB. And then lastly, we're going to look at Nolan Arenado, uh, a, a player who has really intrigued me over the past season and a half. And I want to share with you some research on him that will, in my view, explain why he should or shouldn't be in the conversation for one of the best baseball players in the MLB. So let's get this episode started. All right, so let's get into the Jake Arrieta contract situation. Jake Arrieta about to be a free agent at the end of this year, and he just signed the biggest arbitration deal we have seen in the history of Major League Baseball, getting around $14 million for one year in arbitration. And, uh, you know... It, you can make an argument he deserves every penny of that, if not more at this point in his career. Uh, 
You look at his statistics right now. He's at a uh, he's nine and one with a one point eight ERA, point nine six three WHIP, uh, eighty seven strikeouts compared to twenty six walks. Uh, he has uh, what is he at? One complete game, one shutout. I mean, he's he's been lights out all year. He's one of the best pitchers. Uh, the only person I'd probably put ahead of him right now is Kershaw as a regular season pitcher, because we all know about Kershaw in the postseason. But um, as of right now, he's 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 easily top three uh, pitcher in the MLB. And uh, he beat out both Kershaw and Granke last year for the Cy Young. So he had a better season last year. Let's see how he finishes up this year. But uh, one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk about Jake Arrieta and his contract situation with the Chicago Cubs is because it has a huge impact on the Chicago Cubs and their future. And I don't know what Theo Epstein and the Chicago Cubs front office want to do with Jake Arrieta at this moment. But, uh, you know, Jake Arrieta said he's not, he's not giving any home hometown discount for the Chicago Cubs. Um, Scott Boris is going to want his money for his client. And he always seems to be getting top dollar for his clients, but, uh, it's definitely something worthwhile to talk about. But, uh, First, I want to talk about Arietta, and I want to say that Arietta has not always been this lights out. You, you look at the beginning of his career, he got called up to the bigs in 2010, uh, played from 2010 to half of 2013 with the Baltimore Orioles, and his stats were very underwhelming. Uh, you, you could make an argument that he wasn't even supposed to be in the, in the, the starting rotation for a Major League Baseball team. I mean, you look at... Let's just take one year. Uh, th- this is his worst year, but uh, 2012, three wins, nine losses, a 6.2 ERA and 114 innings pitch, 18 games started. And uh, it, that that's just not something that's going to keep you in the majors that long. And I'm surprised the Orioles kept him around that long. I mean, towards in 2013, they were turning him into a long relief pitcher. Uh, they were just at the point where it was just trying to figure out a place for him, and he was he and the Orioles they weren't the best back then, so he he got a little leniency with getting in the in the starting rotation there, and uh, you know you look at his advanced statistics from those years, and he's he's in the negatives for wins above replacement or just above zero. Um, 2010, 2011, he's walking four. Four people, his walks per nine innings is 4.3, 4.4. And, you know, that's where I think a lot of his problems stemmed from early in his career. He had a control problem. I mean, if you're walking four people a game, you're, people are going to get on base, especially in the AL with the DH. And, you know, they always say the ERA is add one on or subtract one for AL pitchers with their ERA. I don't know if that's all true, but if it is, it helps out Arietta a little bit, but it doesn't explain why he should have this a five, six, seven ERA, whatever it is. Um, you look at uh, some other of the advanced statistics, and he's he's in the negatives for for RAA um, for RA nine. His RA nine was consistently off the average each year in Baltimore. Um, so j- just to clarify, RA9 is ERA, but with unearned runs. And like the RA9 average is what an average pitcher's RA9 would do against the same opponent, opponents with the same defense in the same ballpark. So an Arietta is well below the average. So basically saying that he was he was a very below average pitcher during his time in uh, with the Orioles. And uh, it you, you don't have to really explain the advanced statistics too much. Um just because his his statistics just don't really line up with what he has done in Chicago. So he got traded halfway through the 2013 season, and, uh, you know, things just took off for him. And, and there's really no explanation behind his success, other than I go back to the walks and the control thing, and you look at his, his walks per nine innings, Starting in 2014, he's at 2.4. 2015, last year, he's at 1.9. And, you know, his strikeout rates, strikeouts per nine is 9.6, 9.3. It's consistently in the nine. So, you know, you cut down your walks by two people a game, and you're, you're going to see some vast improvements. Um, 
His RA9 is now well above the average. And actually, in 2015, the RA9 average for for a pitcher with the same same defense, same ballpark, same opponent, what have you, would have been a 4.22, but he was at a 2.04, showing he was at elite level, which, I mean, I don't really need to tell you that. He was one of the best last year. Um, his war was 8.7. Uh, 2014 was 5.3. He used to be in the negatives. It, it, the statistic, I, I've never seen a player with such a big jump in the statistics in a positive way as Jake Arrieta has experienced. And so that's, that's the one major risk I see with Arietta from the get-go. What is stopping Jake Arietta from going back to his old ways in Baltimore? What, what, what's going to happen when, you know, he's going to want a seven year deal and the Cubs give it to him. And then in year four, year five, he, he's not throwing 96, 97. He's not throwing all speed in the high eighties. He's losing his velocity. What if his control goes? Is he going to go back to his ways in Baltimore? I mean, I, I, I just can't answer that. And I just don't really know the answer behind his success. I mean, people were saying PEDs, but I just I, I want to leave PEDs out of the, the discussion. Um, it's it's not fair, and it's a very sensitive subject to be talking about that uh, with Jake Arrieta because you, you gotta you gotta like the guy. He he came from he came from the bottom basically, one of the bottom pitchers in the MLB, and now he's he's at the top. So uh, you gotta respect that, and and it's the innocent until proven guilty thing. So let's let's just leave that out of the equation. And, and I'm tired of people talking about PEDs and scandals and whatever. And before you you, you, they, you really don't know much about the entire situation. You got to look into the statistics behind it. Um, so that's the first thing. I, I just don't know if the risk or if the reward is going to be greater than the risk for the Cubs in this situation. Um just looking at his statistics from Baltimore, it's it's got to be scary. I mean, he's had more bad years than he's had good years. And let's take that into account. Do we really have a big enough sample size of his success to say we can give this guy a seven-year contract, $200 million plus? That's what, that's what the Cubs have to be looking at right now. Um, and I think the risk... Uh, is a lot more than the reward here. So this is, this is the first reason why I think the Cubs should stay away from Jake Arrieta. Um, and secondly, you look at the, all the long contracts the Cubs have taken on. You look at the eight years, $184 million that they gave to Jason Hayward this offseason, which, in my opinion, is one of the worst contracts I've seen in a, in, in a, in a while, actually. And, you know, advanced statistics have really favored Jason Hayward his entire career. And you could even make the argument that his best year was his rookie year. His on-base percentage, OPS, slugging, war, batting average were all either the best or second best he's ever had in a single season in his career, which was six years ago. Six. So if you take that into account, why is this guy, why is this guy now suddenly getting a $184 million contract for eight years when he's been... He's been declining his his entire career from an offensive standpoint. I, his defense is is very good, and he's probably the best right fielder defensively, if and one of the top ones um, in the MLB. But are we really going to be paying 184 million dollars for a guy with average offensive output and and very good defense? I I, I don't know if that's the answer, especially when they had Schwarber, they had Soler. Uh, they ended up signing Dexter Fowler after the fact with the Hayward contract, but Dexter Fowler has turned into probably one of the most productive players on, on the Chicago Cubs roster for the money he's getting paid. Um, so that's the first big contract. And Lester just signed, is, in, is now in year two of his six-year $155 million contract. Ben Zobers has a four-year $56 million contract. Rizzo has a seven-year contract. Soler has a nine-year contract. Um, and, and like I said, Arietta and Scott Boris are going to want seven years. And, it, and what I think about these long-term contracts, seven years plus, is that you can't take on too many of them at once. And that's what the Cubs are doing right now. They have about four or five contracts that are above seven years 
or right around that area. And, you know, that's you're going to start digging yourself into a hole with if these players don't pan out, if they're not producing the way you thought they would in year four, year five, even year three of the contract, what are you going to do? You're going to you're going to trade them and still bite the bullet with a, with a lot of spending a lot of cash on these guys. Um, I just never been a proponent of these long term deals. I think that if you do it, if you're going to do it, they better be young players and pre- prefer- preferably pitchers. Um, Arietta. He's, you know, he's up there. He's getting, he's going to be turning uh, 31. Or he just turned 30. So if they're signing him a seven year deal, he's going to be 37 by the time he's done. And I, I just can't see, I just can't see him producing the same way he has been. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Um, but you, you look at all, all these long term deals that the, Scott, that the uh, Cubs have right now. And I think it's just too much risk they're taking on at once. And and uh, not to mention the Cubs are going to have to figure out what they want to do with Chris Bryant and Addison Russell in the near future. Um, they're going to want long-term deals, and they deserve them. They probably deserve them more than uh, Jake Arrieta because they're young. I mean, Chris Bryant has has a, a huge ceiling for offensive output. Uh, rookie of the year. And Addison Russell is is a plus shortstop in MLB. He's not he's not he's not as good as Chris Bryant, but when you when you get a good young shortstop who's uh, who's been proven to produce for you, you, you got to sign him. So uh, they got to think about signing them the next year or two. And is are they going to be able to do all of that and want to take on even more long term contracts after Arietta if they sign him? And I just I just don't think that's the smart move. Um, Arietta's 30 years old. They're going to spend $200 million plus on him. They got to hedge out here and realize that they're starting to create a money pit that's over the next seven to eight years with all of these players. And they got to look at the future. They got to look at the pipeline. Keith Law ranks them as the number four, the number four farm system in MLB right now. They're the best team in MLB. They have the, the fourth best farm system. I mean, I've, I've, I haven't seen too many things like that. Um, but that just goes to show that the Cubs need to let Arietta go. They, they have too much young talent. They're going to be signing some, some big prospects, uh, coming up soon. I can see some prospects coming through the pipeline Four of their top 11 prospects or pitchers. Um, you never know. You, Lackey, Lackey's been serviceable. He's going to be gone, which leads me to think that they're going to they're going to try and sign Arietta but you know you, you, they got Hamill they got uh Kyle Hendricks uh who have been producing very well I mean everybody on the Cubs starting rotation is below a three right now in the RA which is which is pretty ridiculous when you think about it so um but I think the risk uh outweighs the reward right here you can't take on these these long-term contracts and and expect them to all pay off in the end. There's going to be a couple that are just going to bust, and I think they need to to realize that they got a lot of youth, and they should spend more on their youth, and and maybe just get a spot starter like, uh, you know, I, I know uh, Edison Volquez is coming up uh, in free agency, uh, Brett Anderson, uh, Francisco Liriano next or er, in two years. Uh, so I mean, they could. They could get like a, a number two, number three guy, move Lester up to the one. I, I just think that that Arietta has a has a couple too many question marks right now. Um, and when you look at the market for free agent pitchers, it doesn't favor the Cubs at all in the contract talks. They're gonna have to be paying Arietta a lot. Like look at Kershaw, seven years, two fifteen million. Scherzer, seven years, two ten. Price, seven years, two seventeen. Granky, six years, two oh six and a half. And Boris is going to go up to the Chicago Cubs and make the argument that Arietta has been more dominant than all of these guys. He beat out uh, both Kershaw and Granke for the Cy Young. So how can Arietta get less money than these guys? And and that's a valid argument. And and that's going to be a tough thing for the Cubs to to counter with. And uh, I think he's going to be getting seven years, 220, 210, up in that range, possibly even more. Um Especially if he goes to free agency, he's going to get more. The, the Cubs are going to are probably going to sign him for a little less, um, and I think Arietta would be willing to sign for a little less, even though he said he'd give him a discount. Um, but 
You even look at a guy like Steven Strasburg, and that's another one of Boris's clients who he signed to an extension in the middle of this year, which he usually doesn't do. He likes to see his guys go to free agency at the end of the year, get more money. But he got the seven-year, $175 million extension for Strasburg. And it, it's pretty clear that Arietta has been far more productive than Strasburg over the last few years. So in effect, Boris has really just guaranteed Arietta at least $200 million if you compare him to a Steven Strasburg getting his seven years, $175 million. Um, so, you know, the Cubs are going to be have to pay up for Arietta and and paying up right now with this long-term deal, I, I just still, again, I don't see his, this contract paying off in year four, year five, even year three. I, I think Arietta has been very good recently. I'm not going to deny his success. I know he's one of the best pitchers in MLB right now, but the, the, the Cubs got to look back and look at the broader scope of their franchise, look at how they've built their franchise. They built it on young talent. They built it on getting players to come up through the pipeline and produce. So, And Arietta wasn't one of those guys. He's 30 years old now. Um, $220 million is a lot for a 30-year-old uh, with only – uh, three good years in MLB, more bad years than good years, actually. So, uh, you know, that's something that the Cubs have to consider. And, and uh, the last thing I think they should consider is their pitching depth. I know that Lackey's going to be gone in a couple, in two years, and he's at the age of 37. And um, he's he, he's still producing. He's, he's under three right now. So, uh, and Jason Hamill uh, revitalized his career is currently – He's currently sitting around the two. And then Kyle Hendricks is down in the twos as well, and he's only in his third year in the majors. So, you know, they have a pretty impressive starting rotation right now. Um, and if they can – if Hamill and Hendricks can can really keep it going uh, the next couple of years, I think that I think that they could, you know, move up to, to number three, number two guys, and they could – they don't even need Arietta at this point. I mean, the Cubs have the best pitching staff in the MLB right now. And I I would make the argument that even without Arietta, they could be a top five, top ten, easy. And we all know their offense is, is very good, and they're scoring lots of runs each game. So it, even if they had a top ten pitching staff with the hitting they have, they could they would still be dynamite out on the field. So, so – with the with the pitching depth, as I mentioned earlier, they let let's let's assume they let Arietta walk, which I think they should do. Why don't use the money to spend on uh, Marco Estrada, Francisco Liriano, Jaime Garcia? In 2018, those guys are all free agents. Uh, like I said, Anderson and Volquez in 2000, and this upcoming free agency. So, and the and. Uh, Jason Hamill is also up for contract in a year. So we have to look at, once again, look at the broader scope of things. They, they're going to be able to pick. There's going to be pitchers coming up in free agency. They're going to be able to make moves at the deadline. They got a lot of prospects. They got the number four farm system in MLB right now. So, you know, and these guys, it's, it's a tough thing for the guys in the, in the farm system right now. They have a number four farm system, but – are these players really going to make it up and play for the Cubs? I mean, the Cubs are pretty stacked at each position right now, and their bullpen's great, starting rotation's great, as I said, and there's not really a lot of holes in their lineup. Uh, so are these players even going to make it? So why not trade them away, get get a, get another pitcher if you let Area to go, uh, you know, get, get a role player, a guy, a bench player who can come in and pinch hit. So... Um, they could use their assets a little more wisely than just spending it all on Jake Arrieta. Um, so, so in conclusion, I, I just think that these long-term deals throughout the MLB, which the market has dictated, I mean, the players and their agents have, have the, the owners, the management, the front office, the GMs under their thumb with these long-term big deals. And then, and it's hard to to not sign them as in the front office because you realize that these players that are demanding these contracts are are once in a once in uh you don't get them every f three or four years or coming every ten or fifteen years so you want to lock them up and and I know that 
and I'm not going to sit here and say that you should never sign someone to to a large contract, seven, eight years, whatever it may be. Um, but we we you have to look into it more. You have to do do more research. You have to realize that thirty year olds, thirty plus year olds, they're not going to be producing when they're thirty six, thirty seven, like the way you 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 are paying them. And uh, I think that guys that should be be be, uh, be paid the big bucks right now. Our guys like Machado, Harper, Trout, um, Nolan Arenado, uh, guys that are young, guys that, and, and Chris Bryant as well, um, guys that are young, guys that still have a high ceiling, we, that we've seen production out of that, that will pay off because their last years of the contract will be when they're in their early 30s. So if, we, if, we're, if we're talking about seven-year deals. So I think that's where you want to put your money um, if you're a front office in the MLB. And, and just taking on Arietta a long-term deal um, is just, it, like I said again, the risk outweighs the reward. I think that Arietta is not, Arietta is going to have, I think he'll have a couple more good years, but when he hits 34, 35, I, I don't know if his velocity is going to sink probably and, and you never know with his control. His control has been has been uh, suspect, especially early in his career. So, committing to a thirty year old pitcher with only three years of good pitching on his resume is is scary. It, it, it's very scary, and I, I just don't think it's worth it. And uh, I don't know what uh, Theo Epstein and the Cubs front office will do about it, but um, I know what I would do if I was sitting in that chair, and I'd say. You know, Jake Arrieta, we, it's been a pleasure. They, they might win a World Series this year. Um, say thank you for, for uh, taking us to a World Series and leading us to a World Series. But uh, I think it's it's best that we part ways. Uh, we, we just don't feel like taking on another long-term deal. We got a lot of young players, and and we just we just really like where we're at right now. And, and it's, not, it's not anything against you, but it's – it's that we have a lot of depth in our system. We have, we have a top five farm system. We have good pitching depth. We're young and we want to stay young. And that's where I think the Cubs are going to succeed in the future is, is just by having a young team that continually improves year in and year out. And, and I just don't think Arietta fits into that equation right now. It's a shame because he's a very good pitcher and he fits well with the Cubs and, and the fans love him. But I, it's a tough thing, but I think they have to let him go. Um, we'll see how Theo Epstein and the Coast front office handle this situation. And I'm, I'm actually very intrigued to see how they'll handle it. And it, it should be something to watch for in the offseason. So I got a little long-winded on the Jake Arrieta contract. And we're going to start looking into the MLB draft. It's happening tonight. Okay. Um, it's going to start at 7 p.m. on the MLB Network. And it's going to be a really good draft, I think. I always like seeing the MLB draft, seeing players that you're going to see down the road on major league teams, perennial all-stars. And it's just, it's just a good time of year to see see all the hard work pay off for, for these top prospects. And I just want to mention some news that's been circling around in the MLB, in the MLB draft um, confinements, and that is that Jason Groom, who many scouts and many websites have put them, him as the overall number one prospect. Not necessarily that he would go number one, but that he was the best prospect. And and I actually got the the pleasure to see him see him play uh, Barney at New Jersey, and uh, I saw him play when he was 15 years old. He was thrown. Uh, about low 90s, 90, 91, with, with a tight curveball, and you could just tell he was something special, throwing effortlessly from the left side. Uh, just, just very projectable, good size. He's uh, 6'6", 220 pounds, only 17 years old, uh, tops out at 96, hits 90, 94. Many people have said that he is the, the most comparable player to Clayton Kershaw that they've seen. Uh, in the draft, and he has one of the best curveballs that a lot of scouts have seen. So he's committed to Vanderbilt originally, and then just last night or yesterday, 
He is decommitted from Vanderbilt and will will go to says he will go to junior college powerhouse Chipola College, and that that brings a major red flag to a lot of teams because you can see that what Groom is doing here is that he is just giving himself more flexibility in the draft so that if he doesn't get drafted by a team he likes or he doesn't get the type of money he wants, he can just enter again next year because in junior college, all you have to do is you can enter after every year. So uh, you can enter after freshman year. So um, uh, he can't do that at Vanderbilt. He would have to finish through his junior, junior season. So uh, I think that Groom wants wants a certain amount of money, wants to be go to a certain team. So so he's he's likely going to fall to my top 10. Normally he'd be in my top 10. It was a last-minute change. Uh, I'd be going in the three to five range around in there. So, so that's a, that's a big shakeup. And as well, uh, Delvin Perez, the shortstop, 17 year old shortstop from the International Baseball Academy in Puerto Rico, um, just tested positive for PEDs. Uh, that news came out, uh, a day, a day or two ago. Um, so, so obviously a lot of teams are shying away from him. Keith Law had him num- ranked as high as the number three prospect on ESPN, uh, and, and he was, a, he was a solid player. He, he's very young, uh, very good defensively, and, uh, he's just, just a little raw right now at 6'3", 165, need to put on some muscle, probably while, why he was taking the, uh, while he tested positive for the PEDs, honestly, but, uh, um, so those are two players to mention that aren't going to be in it, and, um, so I'm going to start off at number 10 with the White Sox. Um, the White Sox don't really have a catcher they, they have Alex Avila right now uh Dion near Dion near Navarro I'm sorry um but you know I, I like the catcher from Miami Zach Collins here uh 6'3 220 was a top 100 prospect out of high school but he dropped to the 27th round because he wanted to go to college um so I, I watched some videos of him good size powerful powerful swing good plate approach he had the second highest OBP in the country uh, 13 homers, 53 RBIs, 358 average, 534 on base percentage in the ACC. That's some pretty solid stats. And the only the only caveat on him is he's got some questions on his defense. They could move him over to first base, but I think if the White Sox really like him as a catcher, they'll take him here. So and and honestly, I, I love my catchers. I, I I love watching good prospect catchers. Um, and and he he's a plus prospect as a catcher, and and he has one of the best power bats in the draft. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna say that he's gonna go number ten to the White Sox. Um at number nine we got the Detroit Tigers. Uh many have said they're in a win now mode. So I, I think a, a college pitcher um fits what they want here. Um that way he's gonna he's gonna be more prepared and ready to get into the majors. And I like the the kid out of Mississippi State, Dakota Hudson, uh six five, two oh five. He had two separate streaks this year without uh having an an earned run and that was a 34 and two-thirds inning streak and a 27 inning streak so i mean uh there's a there's a lot to be said for that as long as with sitting at a 93 to 95 mile per hour fastball and hitting 97 um and he throws a slot like a slider in the upper 80s so so he, you can see he's a very polished pitcher and, and he's got some experience in college so Look for him to go number nine to the Tigers. And at number eight, we're going to go – we're going to have the San Diego Padres, and I'm going to say they're going to take Matt Manning, the the right-handed pitcher out of Sheldon High School in California. Uh, 6'6", 185. Uh, He's the son of of former player – NBA player Rich Manning. Um, So he's got the pedigree going for him. Uh, 96, 97 mile per hour fastball tops. Um, with a, with a nice hard curveball, obviously very athletic, and he's very projectable, good basketball player in high school. Um, I think the Padres are, are looking for, for an arm, and, and he's an athlete too, so I, this seems like a good fit for the San Diego Padres at eight. And at number seven, um, a lot of word is said that the Miami Marlins like the, the high school arms in this draft, and they're going to go with Braxton Garrett, uh, the left-handed pitcher from Florence High School in Alabama. And uh, the 18-year-old, he's he's committed to Vanderbilt. Um, a slower curveball with a ton of break, and it and it hits 76 to 80. So so you can see it's on the slower side. 
88, 94 mile per hour fastball. So again, on the slower side, but he's got he throws it at a tough angle to see for hitters. You can tell from his videos, um, and he's not necessarily the most dominant pitcher in this draft, but I think he has the chance to be the most consistent. I think he has he has one of the highest floors of any pitcher in this draft. So I think this is a very safe pitch or safe pick for the uh, Marlins at number seven, and uh, at number six. You got the Oakland Athletics, and th- there's been talk that they they wanted either uh, a Groom, Lewis, Maniac, or Senzel. All of them I have going before. Besides Groom, Groom with the with the news coming out that that's going to drop him probably late first round, if that uh, mid to late first round. So I don't see Groom. So all these players I'm going to uh, mention uh, a little later, but. So the, so the Oakland Athletics are going to take Corey Ray, a uh, junior outfielder from Louisville. And uh, I, I really like Ray. He's, he has a quick, quiet swing as a lefty. doesn't have great size at 5'11", 185, but he's very athletic and he's got, got a lot of good speed. And, and playing against tough competition, uh, 15 homers, 60 RBIs, 319 average. Uh, and... And something that really I really liked about him is his 44 stolen bases and zero caught stealing. Um, that's pretty ridiculous. And and he's something he's he's an athlete for the athletics. So uh, I really like Corey Ray. I thought he could have gone higher. Um, I just think that a lot of teams are looking for for the raw power, you know. And and I don't know if Ray really provides that or he's going to provide that throughout his career people have compared him to Curtis Granderson but I, I think that his power is a, is a little on the low side to uh to be drafted uh higher in this draft and I think some of the guys that are drafted the two bat the three bats that are uh t- that I'm gonna have above him uh provide a little more power at the plate so that's the reason why I have him going number six but uh Corey Ray at number six the athletics and at number five we got the Milwaukee Brewers uh looking they're really looking for the guy with the most tools uh, I think, and and they really liked Perez before the failed drug test, but uh, but the guy would maybe the most tools in the draft coming out of La Costa Canyon High School in California. You got Mickey Moniak, uh, very pure hitter, hits from the left side, six two one ninety, uh, hits consistently to all fields. Um, he's got really good speed, and he's a plus fielder, and and a lot of scouts love his intangibles, knows the game really well. Um, is, has a lot of heart. So uh, that, the kid's committed to UCLA, but he's not going to be going to UCLA. He's going to be signed with the Brewers at number five. And uh, at number four, we got the Colorado Rockies. Uh, Rockies, the Rockies, I really think, need a pitcher. It's very hard to entice a pitcher to go to Colorado the way the ball flies out there in free agency. So um, I think that this is where they go in the draft. They're going to take Riley Pint. The right-handed pitcher out of St. Thomas High School in Kansas, the 18-year-old is 6'4", 210 pounds, and he's topping out. He's topped out of the showcase at 102. Uh, sits 93, 97. I mean, this this kid, he, he's he has a he has one of the best chances of being the first number one pick as a right-handed pitcher. But I, I don't think he's going to be number one. But I mean, if you're throwing 102, you're you're going top 10. Uh, with and he's got the tight curveball. Um, Looks like he's overthrowing sometimes, but when you're throwing that hard, uh, I think it kind of always looks like you're overthrowing. So uh, he's committed to LSU, but um, he's going to sign with the Rockies, and and I think that this kid has a very high ceiling if he can uh, keep his stamina up, stay in the high 90s, mid 90s throughout the game. So I really like Riley Pine at number four of the Rockies, and at number three, we got my Atlanta Braves. I'm an Atlanta Braves fan. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I haven't told all of you guys that yet. Uh, I don't think I have, but, uh, it, it's a little bit embarrassing at the moment, but I really like what they're doing. Um, they've been going pitching heavy a lot, get selling a lot or, uh, trading a lot of their prospects for pitchers. So I think they're going to go with a bat here. And I've heard reports that they really like Kyle, Lew- Kyle Lewis, the, uh, Mercer university outfielder. Um, he's, uh, he was a junior, uh, he had 20 home runs, 72 RBIs, 395 average, and a 535 on base. Uh, named Baseball America's Player of the Year. Uh, you know, he takes big cuts, uh, very athletic, very raw. Uh, and I think that he has one of the biggest upsides 
uh, and highest ceilings uh, for a hitter in this draft. And I think the Braves really need to take a chance on a power hitter. They don't have a lot of power in their farm system. So I think this, this is the route they need to go. And at number two, the Cincinnati Reds. And the Reds either wanted A.J. Puck or Nick Senzel. And, uh, you know, I think I'm going to give a spoiler, and Puck's going to go number one to the Phillies. So they're going to take Senzel here at number two. And they really like Nick Senzel, the third baseman from Tennessee. Um, he likely is the guy that most scouts have said that he's going to be the most consistent and has going to have the highest floor out of any player in this draft. Um, the MVP of the Cape Cod League hits for both average and power. Uh, hasn't played third for long, but he's adjusted well to it. Um, and you look at his videos, very quiet, simple swing, uh, no big leg kick, barely lifts his leg off the ground. So that's that's the type of stuff I like to see in a prospect. Uh, uh, good uh he could, does a good job at recognizing pitches, a uh, seasoned hitter. Uh, needs to get a little more home run power, I think, but uh, he's, he hit 352 uh, in college, and, and with 25 stolen bases last year, he, he shows a little athleticism. So I think he's going to be a really consistent player uh, in the MLB as he, as he gets older. And at number one, the Phillies are going to take A.J. Puck, the left-handed pitcher out of Florida. A lot of questions surrounding him, surrounding his heart. Uh, only had two wins on, on a Florida team that was number one in the country in, uh, in 15 games, uh, but had a 3-2-1 ERA, 95 strikeouts, and 70 innings pitched. Um, throws a lot like Jason Groom, the high schooler, but he's got more size. 6'7", 230, uh, touches 96, 97, a slider consistently 88, 90. I mean, this guy, this guy has, has great upside. He's big, great frame, and even though he struggles with control sometimes, I think the Phillies really want this guy. They can't pass up on him, and I think he could complement Aaron Blair very nicely down the road. So uh, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm saying. How the top ten the MLB draft is going. Talk about here is uh, I really want to talk about Nolan Arenado, the third baseman for. This Colorado Rockies, a 25-year-old, um, he he's on the verge of being a superstar right now. If not, if he isn't already, um, the guy was drafted in the second round in 2009 out of high school. Um, he's only made a million dollars so far in his career, and and you look at his output so far in his career, and he he's really improved every year he's been in the majors. Um, and when he made his debut in 2013 in 133 games, 10 home runs, 52 RBIs, a 267 batting average. Uh, you look at 2014 in his second year, he's got 18 home runs, 61 RBIs, a 287 batting average. And then he really broke out last year in 2015 with 42 home runs, 130 RBIs, and a 287 batting average. So this guy... You know, this guy keeps improving. Um, you can see in 2016 so far this year, he's got 18 homers, 49 RBIs, and a 294. So, and we're only 57 games in. He's played 57 games. So, you know, this guy, he's got a lot of potential, and, and he's been improving every year. Um, he's only making $5 million this year, which is uh, pretty insane to think about. Uh, he's arbitration eligible in each of the next three years. Uh, can first be a free agent, um, I think 2019 he can become a free agent, um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him uh, sign, a, sign a contract soon, or they're going to, the Colorado Rockies are going to do the arbitration route, sign him, give him a, about five or six million more each year, uh, could be pricey, but uh, we'll see how it all pans out with his contract situation, because he definitely deserves more than five million dollars, uh, He's the best player on their team, uh, probably the cornerstone of their franchise, so they, they should really lock him up at this point. But, but what I want to talk about with Nolan Arenado is how does he compare to the best players in the majors? Is he in deserving to be in the conversation with the Trouts, with the, with the Harpers, with the Machados in MLB? Um, and, and what I'm going to tell you right now is he's not there yet. He's, he's, he's a little bit off. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him get into that conversation within the next year or two. Um, there's, there's one, one caveat, um, 
behind his behind his success that we really need to look into and he really needs to improve upon this um and that would be his on base percentage you, you you look at his on base percentage throughout his career in 2013 his rookie year a 301 2014 328 last year with his monster year uh he only had a 323 on base percentage so i mean that's you you can't you can't be in the conversation as a, as a star player or a or top tops in the MLB at your position when you know it, it, you have an on base percentage in in the low three hundreds. That's just that that is just not acceptable. Now, granted, he has a three sixty nine on base percentage this year, so he's he's made improvements. And I think as pitchers start to fear him a little more, he his, you'll see his on base percentage go up. Um, but I just want to I want to look at. Um, him compared to Trout, Harper, and Machado. So if you look at Trout, he had a he had a uh, offensive WAR of eight point nine last year, with forty one home runs, ninety RBIs, a two ninety nine average, a four oh two on base, and an OPS of uh, nine ninety one uh, or nine nine one. And um, you compare that to Arenado, who's who was sitting at a three twenty three on base. Compared to Trout's 402, he's sitting at Aaron Otis sitting at an OPS at 898. Uh, Trout's at 991. Um, so, so he's a, he's a little bit off there, um, and and it and it's pretty crazy. The advanced statistics really take into account that on base percentage because you know with on base percentage, it, it, that's how you're scoring runs. Uh, you know, the, what the thing that most people forget about is that uh, hits. Hits don't necessarily always score runs, but you know if you get on base, if you're consistently getting on base at, you know, in the 400 clip, you're you're going to score a lot more runs. You're going to provide a lot more value to your team, especially when you start getting in a slump. You get a couple walks, um, and I think Arenado's uh, kind of failed at doing that so far in his career. Um, so then now let's look at Harper: 42 home runs, 99 RBIs, a 3.30 average last year with a 4.60 on base percentage. With a 1.109 OPS, leading to his offensive WAR equaling Mike Trout's at 8.9, uh, and and uh, you know Arenado's offensive WAR is only at 3.8 last year, so we can't really compare those two right now, Trout and Harper to Arenado. I mean the, the offensive WAR is is pretty far off, even though Arenado's put up. Uh, the same amount, if not, or equal amounts of home runs and way more RBIs. He's just he's just not getting on base at a good clip. Um, and and now we're gonna compare him to his fellow uh, counterpart at third base, Manny Machado. Uh, you know, it, it's pretty interesting to say that uh, Arenado he's won three straight Gold Gloves. A lot of people forget about that. And his defensive WAR last year at two point two was better than Machado. So, uh, but. If you look at the war in total, Machado's offensive war brings him up above Arenado in total war. So, you know, they're both very good fielders, and and uh, you know, it seems like if you look at it from a home runs RBIs perspective, that Arenado is putting up better numbers. But uh, Machado's got got the two eighty six average, three fifty nine on base. Um, so his on base is a little better than. Uh, that of Arenado's, and you know that's what's helping out his WAR as well. So I think that Arenado deserves to be in the conversation uh, of MVP candidates, a rising star, one of the top players in the league. But he he's just he's just a step away from Trout, Harper, and Machado right now, and and you can see his on base percentage rising. He's at three twenty three last year. Now he's at three sixty nine. But uh, once he gets his OP, OBP up, pitchers start to fear him more. It's gonna, it's gonna keep rising. And and even though he's not on the level of Machado, Trout, and Harper, um, he gets that on base percentage up, and you'll see his WAR, OPS, etc. You know, all those things rising. And his defense is always gonna be there. Uh, he's many say Machado is the best third baseman, but you look at the advanced statistics and. Uh, you, you can make the argument that Arenado is better. Arenado is, uh, like I said, he's won three straight gold gloves. Um, very high ceiling right here. Um, and he, he's, he's on pace for another monster year. And, uh, 
So even though I'm, I'm saying that he's not on the Trout Harper Machado level, and I think many people would agree with me on that right now. He also hits in Colorado. People say uh, stats are a little inflated in uh, Colorado. Uh, ball flies out a little easier. So he's playing half his games there. You got to take that into account. But he's also hitting good on the road as well. I uh, I don't know the exact statistics, but uh, I, I know he's he's been on the road and he's been hitting well um, at a good clip. Not as good at, as – at home, but it's not that much of a of a drastic uh, difference to to continually make the argument that it's just because he plays in Colorado. So um, I'm interested to see how Arenado improves on his on base percentage. If he can get it up into the 400s, you could see him being in the top of the league in uh, wins above replacement, and uh, especially offensive wins are, wins above replacement. His defensive wins above replacement are 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 unmatched, other than uh, uh, Machado at third base. So. So I'm interested to see what the Rockies do with him. I think they should sign him to a four or five year deal, avoid arbitration, uh, lock him up, give him some guaranteed money, and uh, he deserves the money. He's he he's a player you want to you want to keep it in a, in a Rockies uniform. And uh, like I and uh, I always make the point that if the Rockies ever ever got a a decent pitching staff, let alone a let alone let alone a good one. They they just need a decent pitching staff. Their hitting has always been. Ridiculous. They got Story, Blackman, uh, Carlos Gonzalez, Arenado. Um, they got a good. They got a good squad right there for hitting. But uh, pitching's always been holding them back out there in Colorado. So, uh, so uh, uh, Arenado, you know, he's got the chance to be one of the best. But as of right now, he's still still a step behind the best. So, uh, so that's gonna end the first episode of the Savage Sports Blog podcast, and and I'm glad you guys came along, listened to this. Uh, leave some comments if you have any questions or uh, comments about it. Um, and I uh, hope to get episode two up and running soon. And uh, thanks for all listening.